Howdy. So today we're going to talk about ANCOVA. And I want to draw a uh, distinction between ANCOVA and ANOVA. And the distinction is the letter C. <laughs> um, so analysis of variance and analysis of covariance. I wonder why they don't have ANOCOVA should be ANOCOVA. Anyway, it's ANCOVA because COVA stands for the analysis of covariance. So what is covariance? Covariance is just the sum of the product of deviations of x from its mean and deviations of y from its mean. Given the shorthand version first, and the longer hand version here. And this should actually look to you, so this is covariance. This should look to you a lot like a variance, because a variance is what? The summation of the squared deviations of x from its mean. So quantity squared, let's write it on out. Instead of just put a squared sign, you can see that these are very similar. The only thing that's changed is we have the two variables co-varying instead of the one variable varying with itself. <laughs> okay, so in a sense, the covariance is the more general term, um, more general than uh, variance, and variance is a subset of covariance where we have deviations and how they co-vary with themselves. Okay, so uh, I don't want to dwell on covariance as a formula today, though. I want to dwell on where does uh, ANCOVA fit into our sort of uh, lexicon of statistical tools. Okay, so if we have an X and a Y, and we have nominal X and continuous X and the same options for our y, what we've been working with largely to this point are two of these ANOVA. We have nominal x, continuous y, and then we have regression. We've spent a couple videos talking about. So when we have an ANCOVA, what we're talking about is a continuous x but also a nominal x. So where does that fit into this? It's kind of right in between, isn't it? So we can have ANCOVA kind of visualized in between ANOVA and regression as properties of both. It has a nominal x variable and it has a continuous x variable, maybe more than one of each, who knows? Um, so ANCOVA, uh, <clears throat> contains uh, at least one continuous variable and at least one nominal variable. So then we're dealing with here a general linear model and we're going to treat the um, x variable the same way we would in an ANOVA or a regression it's just that we might have a mixture of the two and we might even describe the model as a general linear model particularly if it's a more complex design okay um, I want to talk about now the first and, and kind of most useful maybe most used case of analysis of covariance. And that's where we have um, a, uh, a factor that's continuous. So let's say we have, for example, um, initial size of an organism. And we know um, that affects final biomass because large organisms tend to get larger, right? So you know you're going to have this kind of relationship. 
between initial size and final size. This is particularly true for plastic organisms like fish, and plants, and things like that. Um, but we also have a treatment on top of that. So some factor um, that has levels A and B, um, and those levels A and B may produce an effect on final biomass as well. Okay, so we have two levels. Here's A and here's B of our treatment. And, um, and they're producing uh, an effect on final bas biomass above and beyond the initial size effect. So we can make initial size um, a covariate in this analysis. And what we can actually do is construct a model in which we have a covariate, initial size, and a nominal variable treatment. So our effects in our model are initial size and treatment. Um, so what does treatment effect tell us? That tells us whether the elevation of these two regression lines is different. And so our treatment effect is being measured as the difference between these two. And, you know, we may have three treatment levels or four. And so we'll ask the same question that ANOVA is asking is, is the elevation of these lines different? We expect initial size to have an effect on final biomass. And we may not even be interested in that. But we want to be able to factor out the effect of initial size by putting it in the model. So this acts as what's called a covariate that allows us to see the treatment effect, see, quote unquote, the treatment effect. Because what if we analyze these data just as a one-way ANOVA? What would the data look like? So we'd have two means, you know, a mean for this group and a mean for this group, and they'd be different. But look at how widely variable they would be, right? They'd have big errors around them, and they'd have big errors around them because of initial size differences. But if we don't put them in the model, and we just look at our final biomass, there's probably going to be no difference. But if we include the covariate, of initial size, <clears throat> we will actually be able to see, quote unquote, the difference between the means. In other words, the treatment effect will be statistically significant because it's clearly having, having an effect above and beyond the effect of initial size. But if we just put treatment into our model by itself without initial size, we probably won't see a significant difference between treatments. So this is an extremely useful thing to think about in advance of doing an experiment. Are there any covariates I could measure that would pull out expected variation and allow me to see my treatment variation and to test it in a more powerful fashion? Often it will be something like initial size. Uh, in medical studies, it can be something like age. Age is pulled out as a covariate. Or um, you know, you can even think of sometimes nominal variables as covariates. You're not interested in them per se, but but you know it's a precondition that might affect your y variable. So um, that's you, you don't necessarily even think that a covariate has to be a continuous variable, although statistically we don't call it an ANCOVA if it's not. But you can think of a covariate as any factor that we put in there to pull out variation that allows us to better see our treatment effect or our main effect that we are interested in. Okay, so that's one element of uh, analysis of covariance is using uh, our continuous variable as a covariate, okay? That's an important one. The second use of ANCOVA is looking at differential slopes of response. 
So again, I'll keep it simple here and just do a two-way. But what if, for example, we had a covariate and um, you know it might be something like initial size. And then we um, treated these individuals randomly with uh, fertilizer. So we have fertilizer uh, low, um, medium, and high. So we might expect, for example, that small ones, small individuals, um, won't be able to respond as much as medium individuals, and they won't be able to respond as much as large individuals because there'll be a competitive hierarchy set up. So this might be the high fertilizer um, level. This might be the medium fertilizer level. This might be the low fertilizer level. Okay, so um, low fertilizer is unresponsive, medium more responsive, high more responsive, but it's differential as a function of initial size in the end. Okay, so so this is suggesting that large individuals are more able to take advantage of, you know, you can think of this in terms of food <laughs> of, uh, of an organism as well. So generally, um, small organisms and, and large organisms won't respond much to low food, but if you add a lot of food, um, the most responsive ones will be the big ones that can eat more and, and grow more as a result. Okay, so anyway, what is that hypothesizing? That's hypothesizing differential slopes. Okay, well we can look at that um, by having our initial size in there, almost like a covariate, and then we have our treatment, and then we have our size by treatment interaction term. Okay, and if we're hypothesizing that there will be a differential response uh, to treatment as a function of initial size, we're actually talking about um, this term, the, in, the size by treatment interaction, or differential slopes, which is kind of how we've talked about two-way interaction before, right? So differential response to size as a, as a function of treatment uh, for our final biomass. In this case, we're, we're actually interested in the size effect um, but we're interested in it primarily because it might be differentially responsive to size as a function of treatment. And so ANCOVA can get at differential slopes by including this second order term. In the case of our ANCOVA where we're just using it as a covariate, we don't necessarily have to include the um, continuous covariate also with the interaction. We can just put it up at the top of the model, pull out that variation due to the continuous variable and then look at the treatment effect above and beyond. But here we're actually um, interested in the differential slope response and we put it in. By the way, if we just put in the covariate, we don't put in the interaction, we're assuming that the interaction is actually zero. We have to assume constant slopes, which may or may not be true. Okay, so this is going to chew up more degrees of freedom here. Um, we'll actually, um, oops, here. Um, we'll have chew up more degrees of freedom by having uh, this third term down here, um, but we'll be able to detect differential slopes, which can be really useful. And of course, you can do this with even more complex models. It gets a little bit harder to interpret the higher order interactions, but we kind of interpret them like we do with ANOVA when we have three-way interactions, for example. Okay, so and and COVA fits between regression and ANOVA, and it can be a very useful general linear model, general linear approach to solving biological problems and, and answering interesting questions. Okay.